What's up guys? Welcome back to Study and Grind. This is episode number two. And as you can see there, I found the little blue thing in the top right. And I'm going to do much of the same thing today. But the only difference is that instead of looking at some hands, looking at a hand where we look at the spot in general and devise a strategy for that spot, I'm going to show you the other document that I actually have as well. So the one I showed last time was called Strategy. It's all in the poker quest folder that I've got there on my desktop. Um, this one, however, is not about broad strategy. It's more specific situations. So what I've got here is a document which I'm yet to actually complete to a meaningful degree, but I've started work on it and it's very much a work in progress. It's another way for me to basically <clears throat> um, store my learning and keep a record of all the review I do of my sessions so that when I get into a spot, I'm not just learning what to do in that exact situation and then forgetting. I'm learning what to do in that situation and then keeping a record of it so I can look over it and see um, the analysis I did and the work I did. Sometimes I even berate my own play. And then I can remember, instead of forgetting, I can retain the knowledge for similar situations. And if I revise it like three or four times, the knowledge of what to do in that spot becomes like really permanent. I never forget it. And the better you know what to do in a certain spot, the more likely it is that you're going to recognize or tag a spot that happens in your live session as a similar kind of situation. And therefore, the more likely it is that you're going to be able to transfer that knowledge over to that new spot. So this is why it's really important that you keep a note of your of your hand history reviews, of your learning, all that kind of thing. I am a bit of a hypocrite because I've only just started doing this recently. I should have been doing this for my full poker career, basically, but we live and learn and we develop not just our game, but our our whole approach to learning as we go and we figure out better ways to do it. So here goes, let me show you this document. This one's called On The Go Notes, which means it's more specific situations as I'm reviewing. It doesn't need to be like a certain spot. In the other document, I was kind of like building my game, building my strategies and all these common pre-flop and post-flop situations. In this one, I'm looking at unique spots as they come up and learning how to play those unique spots. Um, and I'm also doing some other things. Um, so I've got it separated into population reeks population reads, which is not very complete as you can see. I need to actually sit down and review some hands and figure out what people are tending to do. I've got another one to add to this now actually that I've not written in yet. The first one is that regs seem to call a lot of flop check raises and in general fall to a bunch of turns. So on boards where they don't really believe your range, I think they're floating like fairly wide, or at least from the 10-15 thousand hands or whatever I've played this month. It seems that that's the case, that they'll call a flop check raise um, button versus big blind, whatever. On some innocuous board like Queen, 8, 4, 2 to 1 or something like that, then the turn will come like a kind of blank and you'll fire the turn they'll fold. Which implies that they're not really just calling you with top air, they're calling you a lot lighter there, they're floating you with like gutters, backdoor draws, all that kind of thing. Um, and then they're they're giving up the turn. They're kind of like, oh, you fired turn, you must really actually have it. But they don't believe you on the flop. So that's just something I've noticed. It's not going to be true for every opponent but it's going to be true largely for the population, I think, and that's all I'm going for here. Things that are largely true for the population, so that when I don't have a specific read on a player, I can instead turn to my population reads. And I should have loads more of these. I need to really get on this. I should have... Um, I can turn to these reads and use them to, to guide me as to what the best line might be, if I'm otherwise unsure. So pop reads are really important. Definitely recommend you accumulate them. That's what the first section of this notebook is all about. Then I've just separated the unique spots that come up again, not like general situations. You're not going to find do I three bet small blind versus button in this because I've already figured that out. I've already figured out ranges for that. They're in my strategy document. I don't need to look at those as unique spots. These are things that don't come up so often. Things that are a bit more a bit more alien to me. So I've got preflop, which doesn't have anything so far because it's rare that you get that many unique preflop situations, I guess. And I haven't picked out any to review in this yet, although they do exist. You might get a spot where like a fish like shoves over your open and you've got like tens and you're deciding whether you should call or something like that. That would be the kind of thing that would go in here. It's not a standard thing that you want to spend half an hour drumming out a strategy for, but it's something that you might look at if it comes up just so you're prepared next time. Flop. Um, I've got a bunch of hands here. I've started naming the spots now as well, like villain flats, four bet blind versus blind, or ace king misses. I'll look at that hand actually, I'll show you that one, it's pretty cool. I've got the weak type link, I just do it as a link, it's easier. I haven't found a way to like link it to Poker Tracker, or that would, that would be awesome if I could like link in the replayer somehow, I don't think it's possible. 
Um, so I've got my week tight link there and I've got a conclusion in each hand as to what my play is like, what I think of it. Um, so then I've got river and then I've got turn in nice logical order. Let's just swap those around. There we go. So I've got turn. I tend to get a lot of weird spots in the turn. I think you always do. Turns like that street where things just get a bit crazy sometimes. And then river, you always get some interesting liver, liver situations. Yeah, when you like drink too much and wake up the next day. But river situations, yeah. Sure thing, you get lots of interesting ones where you're deciding whether to call or not, whether to triple, you're facing a triple, you get check raise in the river, you want to check raise the river, all these kind of all this kind of stuff. So I name them, then I talk about what I think about the situation, and then I provide the link to it so I can look at the hand and follow along with my own analysis when I go back and look at it in a revision session. And it's very important with this new approach that I revise a lot. So I'm making sure that I revise my my both my strategy, my overall common spot strategy before every session and have a look at a couple of these as well. Then that's my warm up for my sessions. Then after my sessions, what I'll do is I'll look at a new spot and devise a strategy in it then. Um, sometimes I do it before sessions as well. I devise a strategy for a new type of spot, but usually I just sort of look over this to get my brain leveled up to play. And then I've got this tab here called mistakes, which are, I mean, a lot of these other hands could be mistakes too, but these are things that are like inexcusable. These are things that are like bad mistakes that I want to definitely write down so I don't make them again because it really sucks if you're if you make a mistake it's okay you're going to make loads of mistakes in poker it's fine as long as you learn from them and you go forward and you write them down and you make sure that you don't make the same mistake again or at least you make sure that you sort of dramatically decrease the chances of you making the same mistake again if you can nail that part of it then making mistakes is not such a big deal for you because each mistake you make you learn from a lot and your ev goes up for future so in a sense Every mistake, as long as you react to it properly, can actually be plus EV or can at least be less negative EV than it would be normally because of what you learn in the future and how much you improve from making them. So, as much like in language learning, we don't think of mistakes as like a bad thing, they're perfectly natural. It's the same in poker, but you do get some, like when I'm teaching English and like the student just refuses to use the past tense and just says, well, like, last night I go to the disco. It's like, okay, this is now too severe a mistake for your level. I'm going to point this out every time you do it. There's no reason for you to be doing it anymore. That's fine. But if they make a mistake with like the past perfect tense or something that they don't even know yet, I'm not going to bother correcting them because it's just going to cause more sort of hindrance and it's help. It's the same in this, in that I'm not going to correct myself if I just make like a small mis I mean, I might look at it if I make a small mistake. It doesn't take priority, basically. I can't correct everything. I can't look at like a thousand mistakes at once. So I take the really severe ones, or the ones I just don't think I should be making, the ones that are, I'm, I think I'm too good a player to be making, and I look at those and I say, right, why did I make this mistake? I need to not do that. What's the lesson? So first I'll like categorize the spot, like stationing river GTO style, where I need to be exploitably folding. This is a good one. A spot where my range dictates that I should call because I'm quite far up in it, but I shouldn't be playing anyway. I'm near GTO based on the situation. So this is one we'll look at first. We'll look at these two, actually. There are more. There's one horrible hand I played last night where I basically just stationed off an entire stack for no reason that I'm going to look at as well. I make shitloads of mistakes. We all do. Um, as long as we react them the right way, like I say, then it's not so bad. And it's going to happen. That's one thing Like I tell a lot when I make mistakes. I don't go on, I got sucked out on, you know, he got in sevens and beat my jacks tilt. I go on sort of, I am better than this. Why am I playing like such a fish tilt? Uh, that's the kind of tilt I get, so this is what I'm doing to try and fix it. Second hand, check fold to fast fish and redder shove when draws brick, which is usually bad, and I'll get into that as well. So these two are both mistakes that I made that I think are severe mistakes that I should just not be, I should not be making, basically. I've got two more to add to this, actually, from yesterday, why I was just a huge station yesterday, for whatever reason. So, let's look at the first one. Stationing river GTO style when I need to be exploitably folding. Right, so this is the weak type, weak type link. So Hero is in the big blind with King Jack offsuit and this guy, who was a very tight opponent. He was 16-14 tight reg. And for some reason, for some weird reason, I was like so fixated on like my range here that I didn't even bother to look and see that my opponent was 16-14. Like how elementary is that? Like for some reason I just assumed he was like a tighter reg, a, a looser reg. Okay, I didn't have that many hands in him. 16-14 is not like super accurate over a small sample, but it still indicates that he's on the tight side probably, and the fact I didn't pay any attention to my HUD there, even the basics of it, is pretty damn flawed and bad. So one thing I've taken for this hand is always pay attention to your HUD. So we open here, 
sorry, he opens and we fly the big blind, which is, you know, okay, probably to this price. Um, chances are he's probably not quite that tight because no regs actually are that tight and he's a reg. In fact, I'm sure now I've got more hands on him, he's nowhere near that tight. But anyway, at the time it certainly looked that he was really, really taggy. So I could even fold pre-flop here. I don't like 3-betting this hand. I think it's like just dominated when I get called. It's a bad choice to hand the 3-bet bluff. I don't want to be too linear against this guy and just 3-bet it because it's up there. I just think I should fold or flat here. So I decided to flat. Um, and the flop came ace, a jack. He C-bets the flop. Hero has a very standard call here um, because villain's C-bet range is obviously going to be a lot weaker than Hero's hand. And yeah, this hand is like part of Hero's check call range, definitely. No reason to do anything else. I have a check fold most turn guards. Just expecting Villain not to double this turn because he's quite tight. So pretty easy check fold on the turn, but not this turn because it's a king. Hero has to call this turn for sure. He, uh, Villain can still be betting with like ace ten, ace queen maybe, and plus draws and maybe some gut shots or bluffs or something like that. It's possible. Ten nine, for instance. Although it should be noted on this turn that Hero's range is not like Hero's hand is not super strong here. Hero should definitely not raise this turn for value. You can't. Hero's hand is basically a bluff catcher and a thin value catcher. It beats villain's bluff hands and villain's thin value hands, but it's not like a super strong hand or anything like that. So we check call again. This hand is just best in our check call range. There's nothing else to do with it. Um, River comes down and villain bets really big polarizing bet size. And hero calls. I don't like hero's call, my call. I think it's bad. Um, and for a few reasons. Let's have a look at what I said in the document. So it's a really bad call. Versus the 16-14 reg, I think I did two things wrong here. One, I stuck too rigidly to blah blah GTO and far too up in my range when it's a spot where, in my opinion, villain has so few bluffs that I need to be exploiting him. So what does that mean? He has so few bluffs that I need to be exploiting him. That sounds weird, right? But what it means is that villain's range is unbalanced towards value, which it is here. And why is that? Because it's really hard for villain to have air. There's an ace, a king, and a jack out there, like, so much of his range at least has some showdown value. If he has, like, king x of spades, he's not going to bluff the river. Um, if he has, like, queen ten, he has nuts. There aren't that many misdraws. There's, like, ten nine suited, maybe. Not many combos of that. Um, some miss spade draws, but most of them, again, have pairs of straights. Have, like, queen nine of spades, maybe. Um, seven nine of spades, ten nine of spades, stuff like that. But either they're going to have, like, eights in them or jacks in them or kings in them a lot of the time this draws, so it's going to be quite difficult for him to have air here. That's one thing. So I think that villain is, because people don't turn pairs into bluffs here, especially not guys that are like 16-14, my villain in this hand is just really weighted towards towards value. So that's the other thing. I didn't take time to notice just how nitty villain looks. That should be looks, because we don't know if he is for sure. It's a smallish sample I had. We can't be neglecting things as simple as a break type in this sort of decision. GTO shouldn't exclude hero folding in spots where villain's range is the nuts. And this isn't even really a hero fold, it's just like a standard fold, because villain's range here is going to be like better to pair and better. I mean, okay, maybe sometimes, like, th this is the thing with the bet size as well, like, I don't expect to see like jack 8 here, or king 3 suited here, or anything like that, just, or ace queen, just because he bets so big. Like, he's just not betting this river for value this big with ace-queen. If he is betting this river with ace-queen, he's going to bet, like, 16 bucks or whatever, and we can just call, fine, getting a better price in villain's value range. We even beat some of it. But here, we don't beat any of his value range, I don't think. And we only beat bluffs, and we need to be good nearly a third of the time. I don't think we are. Um, okay, so why did I call here? It's always good to not say, this is dumb, don't do it. We need to also ask why did that happen so we can stop it happening in the future. It's no use just scolding yourself for doing something wrong when you've not actually got to the root of the thought process that caused the mistake. We need to look at what caused the mistake as well. So basically here, this mistake is caused by the fact that I have looked at this from a GTO point of view, right? Too much and not from an exploitative point of view. You always need to decide in poker whether you should play close to GTO Okay, you don't even need to worry about this stuff if you're playing like 10 no limit, there are more important things to work on, but for the sake of discussion, um, you need to decide whether you should be close to GTO because you think your opponent's range might be balanced and could contain a lot of bluffs and you just don't know how many. In that case, you can just call like a close to GTO recommended amount. But here, villain's a tight guy, it's hard to have air here, it's not the kind of board I really expect this kind of player to triple very often as a bluff. Um, so his range is very much skewed towards value and better value because of this polarizing sizing. Whenever sizing polarizes your opponent's range and he can't have many bluffs, it basically just makes his range super, super strong and nothing. So his range is super strong here. We have a bluff catcher. 
it does block some value combos, but it doesn't block like any of the 16 combos of Queen-10. It doesn't block like any of the combos of like Ace-Jack, Ace-King, and set of Aces or Eights. So, okay, it blocks some Ace-Jack, Ace-King. doesn't block any Ace-8, Ace-3, um, stuff like that. Not that I really expect to see Ace-3 here very often, because it won't bet turn. But, anyway, enough sort of ranting in random directions. I shouldn't play close to GTO here, because I have a very good reason to exploit my opponent, because his range is clearly quite unbalanced here. So I should exploit my opponent instead, and how do I do that? I do that by folding much more of my range than GTO would have me fold. If this was a spot where I should play really GTO, because villains like tripling loads here is a bluff, then I never call this hand. Then I mean I always call this hand, because it's so up there in my range. Like, I might have ace-jack as a better hand, I can have queen-10, I can have... What else can I have? Like a set, maybe, if I haven't raised at any point. But I, honestly, I check raise this flop, I think, the set of eights, for sure. Um, I might not check raise turn just to like balance my weakest turn calling range here. Um, but I would check raise a set of eights here, or like two pair on the flop. So yeah, I only really have like queen ten as better in my range here. And then something like ace three, maybe, if I call turn with it. So my range is weak. This is very near the top of my range. Um, I wouldn't fold it if I was playing GTO because when Villain bets 27 into 33, what we can do is work out how often Villain would need me to fold. That's my weather just now. It's actually really, look at that, 25 degrees on Wednesday. That's like unheard of for this part of the world. That's crazy. Looking forward to that. It'd be like being back in Italy. Anyway, so Villain bets 27 into 33. So Villain's betting 27 into 60-50 is bet plus pot, so we're going to bet into bet plus pot as usual, 27 into 60.50 which is 33 plus 27, 33.50 plus 27, so I would need to be, Villain needs me to fold 45% of the time let's say, that means that I need to call 55% of my range here in order to not be exploitable. Is King Jack in the top 55% of my range? Absolutely, I need to slam dunk call. If I'm even playing close to GTO, I need to call this hand. If I'm even like folding a bit more than usual, but still not like way miles away from GTO, then I need to call here as well. But I should be playing miles away from GTO because I have very good reason to think that my opponent is just not firing this board. Light, one, it's hard to have air, and two, he's a very tight looking player so far. So because of that, I need to make an exploitable fold here, definitely. Um, I, this isn't even me being results oriented because this hand's from like ages ago weeks ago or whatever, so, or at least a week ago, so I think, like, the fact that I can still look back on it now and say, yep, that's bad, is good for me, and I've solved the mistake in my game, and I know why it happened. It happened because I'm stationing a river GTO style when I need to be exploitably folding, and I know what caused my thought process to be wrong in that instance, which is awesome for me, because I've not just um, corrected the mistake, I've diagnosed the cause of it and corrected the cause, and that's way more important than just correcting the mistake. Okay, let's look at the next one, and then I'm going to get into some live play. So this one is check fold to fast fish river shove when draws brick. Fast fish river shove when draws brick is a bit of a tongue twister. Let's have a look at it. <clears throat> Just takes a minute to come up. Weak tight is it's a nice little bit of nice sight for fold when you know your beat. That's what I should have done the last time. That's like the, the mantra of weak tight. Okay, so... Here, Hero has Ace-5. This is a fish. Fish I don't know a whole lot about. Seems kind of active. Isn't like a crazy aggro fish, but is a fish nonetheless. His stack is 71 bigs. So Hero raises to 3 from under the gun. I'm opening a bit wider here. I've got a fish at my table. A couple of fish, actually. I've got one in the big blind as well. It's got like 35 bigs. So I open Ace-5 here to 3 bucks, um, widening my open range somewhat. And this guy calls in the hijack and everyone else folds. Flop comes ace five nine, so I flop two pair. I go about just betting to get stacks in by the river. I'm leaving myself roughly a pot size bet from the river. It should be noted that I should bet turn a bit bigger just to set up that river shove and make it a little bit more comfortable. So I think I should bet turn like 15, 16 something, 16, 10 or something like that. That way my river shove is a bit less. It just gives him a bit more of a reason to call the river. Okay, so he calls flop, he calls turn. And then I get like the Nightmare River card, it kind of sucks. Uh, my first instinct when I see this card, and I know why my thought process was wrong, was okay, check, fold, that sucks. So I check, and Villain shoves instantly. Like really, really quickly. Okay, let's think about this. What shoves instantly here? Does a 9 shove instantly? Perhaps. 
Perhaps he can have a knight. Does he ever shove instantly with a better ace, like ace-jack, ace-queen? Better aces up? No, pretty much never. I don't think a fish just insta-jams the river with those hands. He needs to think about it a bit, and he probably just checks them back. The nine got there. Blah, blah, blah. Like, fish don't value bet thin. They especially don't shove pot when they value bet thin um, instantly. So these hands are just basically never in his... I shouldn't say never, because fish do lots of random, dumb, weird stuff. But I'm going to say, like, almost never is a better race than his ratio. So all I have to worry about in terms of better hands is 9x. How many combos of 9x is this fish flat in here? A good few. A lot more than most people would. He's going to have, like, ace-9, king-9, like, queen-9 suited, jack-9 suited, ten-9 suited, eight-9 suited, seven-nine suited, seven, nine suited six-nine suited, maybe something like that. Um, so, you know, you're talking, like, a good sort of, like, 20 combos of 9x or something like that. But I think the timing is, again, a bit weird. Does a fish really ship that quickly with 9x? Maybe. What else can he have for value? Pocket fives, I block the hell out of. Pocket sixes, maybe. Pocket nines is one combo. Not so much in the way of boats or quads here. So that leaves what kind of bluffs can he have here? He can have like any diamond drop that's missed, and there are a lot of combos of those. If the fish is calling all those nine x suited combos, he's also going to be calling a lot of just diamond diamond stuff, like jack ten, queen jack, king ten, king jack, king queen jack, eight ten eight. I can go on for ages, right? All these diamond combos. Um, if the ace is out, it's even more. If the ace wasn't out, sorry, but it's not. Um, the ace being there reduces them slightly, but there's still loads. How much equity do I need? That's the next question. I need like 33%, right? It's a plus size bet. They're, they're about slightly, slightly more, but let's just call it 33. It's close enough. Um, am I good a third of the time here, given his range is just 9x and then like lots of busto draws? Yeah, almost certainly. I think I'm good probably like half the time here. So maybe even more than half, slightly more than half, or something like that. So I definitely have the call here. Again, like it's very intuitive in your head to think, okay, I am not good here half the time, or I'm not good here that often now, I want to fold. But all you need to be good is a third, and the timing tell is really significant here. Um, I think I just really need to get this river called. So I think this is a mistake. One mistake where I call down too light, and one mistake where I don't call down light enough, basically. Um, so yeah, pretty happy with the way I've corrected with my error correction in these two hands. Let's see what I said about this. This is a spot where I need 33% equity. Villain's timing is really weak. Then he's an unknown fish. He probably hasn't been this with a sets more than once in a blue moon. And 9 inch combos are easily balanced out by Buster draws and other spans. Easy call. And totally, yeah. Definitely an easy call. Um, so yeah, if I show results, he showed me his hand and he had a bluff here, which made me really mad at the time, which I shouldn't do, but like, I shouldn't even show you guys. It doesn't show me. What he showed, I don't think. No. But yeah, he showed like some busto like four seven or something like that. It was like some horrendous thing that wasn't even a gut shot on the flop. It was like an open end or a turn and a brick or something. I just thought like, oh man. Like sometimes when that happens it can make you think results are indicated. Results are indicated when you can think, Oh my god, like I should have called River but then I thought about it and I thought, you know, I really should have called River, like independent of like the fact he had a bluff this time. That's just clearly a call. And so I looked at it objectively and I decided that my objective, logical analysis agreed with my semi-pissed-off in-game analysis of screw you, you just bluff me, kind of thing. So yeah, definitely a bad fold there on my part and a bad call in the King Jack hand. Mistakes that are pretty bad mistakes, like these are mistakes I don't normally make in, or a severity of mistakes I don't normally make and should not be making if I'm going to be beating 100 NL at the rate I want to. So these are just things I really need to cut out of my game. So they're in the mistakes tab. I've got two more that I'm going to add to this as well today. Um, and I'm going to keep growing it. That way I can keep reviewing them and just seeing what I'm doing wrong in certain spots. Eliminate recurring mistakes. Then all the mistakes I'm making are fresh types. Yes, there are a shitload of different spots that can come up and I can make mistakes in them. But at least they're new ones. And gradually I'm reducing the amount of types of spot I can make mistakes in. And then I'm getting to the bottom of why I'm doing them. And I'm making sure they don't recur. And that's all you can really do. Mistakes are fine as long as you react them in the right way. I'll say it one final time. Okay. So that is all from this part of the video. It's now come that time where I am going to pause the video and I am going to bring up some tables and I'm going to play a session for you guys. So what I'm actually going to do is stop the video and send it in two parts because my player screwed up last time and I don't want that happening again. So you won't notice any changes because um, JGB will work his magic and create a smooth product for you I'm sure. So I'll see you in the second part in one second. What's up guys, I'm back with the second part of the video, currently on four tables of 100s, 
the state of the lobby is not so good right now, let me tell you. In fact, let me show you what the lobby actually looks like. There's one of my tables breaking already. Um, yeah, right now, basically, I'll just grab, jump on this one because it's at least four-handed and I see a fish there as well, and I'll jump off this heads up one and just grime this guy real fast. Not intentional, but yeah, griming is when you like wait on a heads up table, you get the button, and you just open the button, and then the guy falls, and then you leave. You don't give him a button. It's like a grime. It's like something that's unethical in poker, but I don't care. I'm making a video. I'm not going to sit and give him his big blind. <laughs> Call me a... Uh, an unethical poker player. So there seems to be a few fish here. I've got like an $80 stack. That's almost certainly going to be a fish. Um, and we have a bronze star here, which is definitely a fish even before we see him limp. So that's pretty nice. Um, but in general, state of the lobby, like look at this. We have got very few tables. That's what it's like when you get the hundos on a Thursday, Friday, Friday afternoon. Um, on stars, it's just no fun. 10 and L and stuff, there'll probably be a bunch of games going, but as you get up there, you don't really get as many options in the way of table selection. That said, you do still need to be kind of vigilant and keep looking at the lobby, see if some better ones emerge. But if you have like one fish on your table who's like got a decent stack, that's generally okay as long as you don't have horrible regs to your left. Um, here we have a PokerStars Pro. I don't know what this guy's deal is. I've seen him, I've seen him around um, and I don't really remember him being that great. Yeah, this guy's a clear fish, a nice life. Yeah, well, if you make stationary calls, that's what happens to you, man. Let's just see just how severely he stacked off there. It could come in handy. Um, 10 deuce here. I'm just going to go ahead and... Uh, does this guy see that a lot? This is close like to being a flat for me. Honestly, like a suited 10, blind versus blind. Um, I'll go ahead and fold it because he's made it a little bit bigger, but that's like quite close to being a defend. Like when in, When you're playing like Okay, so this guy like barreled the 10-9 and got there on the turn and then just shipped the rest well played from the wreck. The guy stacks off with ace queen. So pretty standard stacking up the fish. Don't rile the fish, just say nothing, man. I guess you can rile fish if you want to like, I don't want him to leave though. <clears throat> Hopefully he doesn't get so mad he like punches a cat and has to leave and take it to the vets. That wouldn't be very good. Um, but yeah, generally if you have like that hand there, um, I'm getting such a good price. If he just mid open flat, I'd probably be like swinging it to a call. It's that close. If I had like queen two or jack two suited, I'd definitely call. Ten two suited is kind of close. It's the old Doyle Brunson, but it wasn't spades, I guess. So. so there we go. So this guy is some kind of looser reg, perhaps, or maybe some kind of reg fish. I don't know yet. It's, it's only 56 hands. You could just run hot and have those stats, I guess, but chances are he's not like a standard reg anyway if he is a regular. Not much going on, so I'll just talk about like my table reads. 9-4 is like, again, I would flat that. I think it's slightly better than 9-2, and the mid open is better. I'll have a cold 4-bit bluff range here. It's a really good spot for it. It's the it's the spot where my cold 4-bit bluff range should be at its widest, because button and small blind, obviously, is an extremely common 3-bet um, spot. So I should probably like have a few more bluffs to value combos there. Good bit of Ace X and King X suited in my three bit four bit bluff range. I need to devise that. I've not actually devised my four bit bluff range, my cold four bit bluff range in that spot yet, which definitely needs to exist and needs to be worked out. So this guy is like multi tabling. I'm gonna assume he's just a very sort of active regular for now and tag him as a reg. I don't have stats anymore for like how active a reg is. I used to do that. I don't anymore just because um, with Ace Ten here, I think we just want to build a pot. And see bet to take it down against like pocket fours and fives and stuff like that, and build a pot against the rest of his range for times we actually get there. I'm gonna check back this turn though because I don't think I want to triple this angry station. I'm gonna fold ace queen suited. It's kind of annoying, but I'm out of position. It's a big three bet, and he looks really passive so far. Looks like a fish. So generally, fish do not have a bluff range there. They have a range that has ace queen in quite bad shape. So I check back here. I'll check back river as well. Um, I don't want to fire. We're folding now fire multiple street bluffs against a guy who's a little bit annoyed and probably not folding. So we can see bet there because we want to build a pot in case we hit and he does have a bunch of hands that can just fold. Open sixes for sure with this guy in small blind, he's a target. Uh, but when he calls flop, I don't think bar barreling turn is good. Getting raised is awful because we have to fold and relinquish all that equity to stack him that we have by making a straight in the river. And also like firing three is going to be like disastrous against someone who's angry and stationary. As I said, so yeah, Ace Jack, we can just fold here against an under the gun open. I don't want to three bet it. It's not a very good hand to three bet 
in general. I'd rather my bluffing range there is going to be, it's already set, so I know what it is, but it's basically like a bunch of suited aces, um, some, some of the best suited connectors, and then um, queens plus ace king for value, probably. Um, I say probably because I'm like trying to disguise it in case like you guys are watching and then you're going to come and own me because I told you what my ranges are. But yeah, <laughs> it's like slightly weighted towards bluffs or something like that, I think. But not by very much. It's a bit more weighted towards bluffs there just because people tend not to... Um, 7-9 suited when there's a fish in the blind. I will 3-bet this. And I'll explain why I 3-bet it only when there's a fish in the blind. That might sound kind of weird. Jack-7 suited is close to being in my, my range there, but it's not quite my 3 bit range there. I'm just going to make this like a 9 and this is like a slam dunk um, 3 bet on table 3. So so 7 9 suited, yeah, I, I will go ahead and 3 bet this hand because I'm flatting wider there. Because it's a fish in the blind, or it looks to be a fish, it's not someone I've played with, it's not someone I have details on, he's 29 14, he's probably a fish. It's not someone that I'm worried about getting squeezed by. So I'm flatting wider for that reason. If I make this like 17 or 18, that's going to leave like 60 something into the flat. We go like 22 here and shove river. Obviously, just snapping if he jams because he can have like naked ace of hearts, pair plus ace of hearts, all kinds of stuff. So pretty standard. I guess the nuts, but oh well. Run bad meat. Um, so yeah, insta jam with nuts on turn. Take a note of that, it could be relevant in the future. Jack 8's a little bit weak for me to defend there. Um, I'm going to defend the threes because, again, I think both of these guys are likely weaker players and I'll get a three way pot in position far more than I'm going to get squeezed or anything like that. So, pretty easy defend for me. Sevens, uh, I think that this guy's a squeezer in the small blind. This guy's a fish in the big blind, though he's playing one table, so I think I definitely want to flat. Here, I'm going to fold the threes here because, yeah, it's just going to play like crap against his betting range as time goes on. I'm going to fold the C-bet here because this guy's super tight. If he checks, I'd probably just check back and get myself the showdown with a pair of sevens here. Um, I could bet for, like, protection and stuff if he checks, but people can check all a bunch of jack X here and stuff on this texture. So I think when a player with a 38% C-bet who's really, really nitty C-bets that board, I can't really call with an ignorant gut shot and a crappy pair, basically. So yeah, this guy's timing is definitely going to be relevant for me in the future, that he just insta snap jams. It's kind of not what you'd expect with the nuts. Usually people like to give you a bit of a sweat there. Um, this pot kind of sucks for me. It's bad to get kind of 3-bet in this situation. I don't really like 4-bet stacking off. Well, this guy's 3-bet like twice here. Um, I could 4-bet stack here, but it's like, do I want jacks in that part of my range? It's really awkward to play out of position, but I think he folds like all the time to 4-bets. And that's the thing. He folds loads to three bets. So he probably folds a lot. Yeah, fold to four bet like all the time. Um, and it's kind of close as to whether four betting. I think I just have to call here. I don't want a four bet range that's that wide. Although I don't like flatting either because I just like it plays horribly to be honest. Out of position here against this kind of range. So it's definitely close. It could just be that I want jacks in my four bet call range there. It's easier to play. It's not going to be too bad and I can four bet bluff like a good bit more if I have extra value in there, so because I do think this guy is like bluffy in that position pre-flop, so yeah, basically. Um, this is kind of interesting when he checks back this flop, I could turn my jacks into a bluff to try and make him fold kings and queens, although it's kind of meh, like I do have some showdown value here, maybe, um, although not a huge amount, and yeah, I just don't really know that he's going to fold a hand like kings to two bets here although it's possible and he could be checking back the case queen on the flop that wouldn't be like unreasonable because he's not going to get three streets from really any of my range so yeah i'm just going to i'm going to check fold the turn i don't really think that i think he's going to see bet a lot of time he has air i don't think check calling turns profitable i'm just going to hope to get the showdown um i think his range is kind of like bluff catchery and stuff i can have nines here and i can have eights here and he can that's one thing i don't think he folds a hand like Maybe he does fold a hand like queens now, or kings. It's almost like I want to turn this into a bluff now, because what air can I guess I can have like king queen or something like that. I don't think he has a nine in his range like basically ever. Um, this is kind of close. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and bluff here and hope that he folds a hand like kings or queens. Oh wow, okay, so he just revered the bottom, bottom part of the straight. But yeah, I mean it's. 
it can also be that he's picked up like one pair there and is going into check mode, but it's bluff range, and I'm just ahead anyway, and it's going to get shown down. But I feel like um, half the time I will go ahead and three bet this, half the time I'll flat it. It's one of those hands that on heads I will go ahead and three bet. It might sound kind of weird to you that I'm using a coin to determine it, but it's the amount of combos I want in my bluffing range there. I don't want it to be like loads and loads of combos. So, yeah. So yeah, it's an interesting spot pre-flop. I mean, it sucks to be out of position just because the hand plays like crap. Um, but the problem is with a 4-bet, like... I mean, he, I think it's better just to 4-bet and have him fold a lot to it and then have some reasonable equity when he ships Queens plus Ace King against me. Like, I have some equity there and if he's folding most of the time, like, I can probably just 4-bet call. Although it's, nah. Don't really see, like, a really fun way to play that hand, to be honest. Um, against this guy... I'm going to flat this sixes against this squeeze. We just want to be ripping this in. Um, I'm not super worried about the guy. Yeah, I'm just going to ship it because I'm not really worried about the guy behind me like ever having anything. I think he's going to fold to all squeeze sizes anyway, which is fine. And hopefully we can bink like a flush here. And we do. We have to be quartering, which is better than, better than splitting. Um, going to check fold to the sixes. I'm basically just... Set mining here effectively or looking for a low board that I can bluff catch on. I'm not gonna bluff catch on this board obviously because he's quite an aggro looking fish. I'm gonna tag him with this bass fish color actually. So, yeah, I use my coin there to decide if the hand is going to be a flat that day or a three bet that day, and it very much just depends upon um, the luck of the dice because the way I've worked my combos there is I have a certain amount of hands that are okay to flat with. And, it, okay, it boils down to this. Like, I don't want my 3-bet range to be, like, really, really weak. Therefore, I don't want to, like, be so polarised that I'm forced to 3-bet, like, 9-5 suited and stuff because I'm flatting all the better stuff. So what I'm doing instead is, instead of having a super weak polarised 3-bet range and flatting better stuff, I am electing to 3-bet, half the time, a bunch of the stuff that I'm also happy to flat. And it keeps my 3-bet range a bit stronger, but also ensures I can flat those hands sometimes as well. It gives me a wide array of hands in my range and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, I don't need to go too big here, cut versus button. I'll just go like 750 as my standard. I'm going to check back here. Hope I get the showdown. The board's just like terrible. Um, when he goes into check call mode, like I might be able to bet twice and get folds from some stuff. But he should be check calling an ace on this turn, which he's never folding. Um, and he's probably never folding like king jack, queen jack, queen 10, king 10. Although he might over two streets, but then he has aces in his calling range over two streets, and I have some showdown value, and I think I should just check here, basically, is my conclusion. If I had no showdown value, like if I just had like Jack X there, I'd definitely just bet turn bet river. But when I have some showdown value on me as well, just use that as a check back part, that way I'm not bluffing like way too often or anything. Queen 10, I'll just fall to the 3-bet, it's too weak to defend in the cutoff. And it's not a hand I 4-bet, because it doesn't have any blockers or anything like that, so... It's a pretty easy fold. Um, this guy opens under the gun. King Queen is like not great here. I'll probably defend now because my price is decent, although it's somewhat dominated and doesn't play that well multi way. But I'm getting like three and a half to one. I think I have to have to defend there. The big blind closing the action for sure. Um, Queen Jack. I'm gonna open because there aren't that many three bettors ahead of me, and I want to get into spots versus this other dude. Um, same deal here. We go with the coin with Ace Four suited. It's in our range that we that we 3-bet half the time and flat half the time. That way we only have half the combos and it makes our range look like the way we look, how we want it to look, basically. Um, backdoor jack, high flush draw here. I just see bet pretty small on these kind of board textures out of position here. Um, if I have ace I see bet the same size. It's not like I'm unbalanced in any way. King-queen, when it checks through, I'm going to check again. I don't really like stabbing here when there is this random fish that can just be like randomly slow playing. Um, yeah. So we just give up here. I'm going to just check call with the backdoor flush draw and the pair against this guy who seems to be... I've not seen him before. Um, River's kind of close. Probably a check fold just because I have so many stronger hands in my range to call with here. I'm like pretty close to the bottom of my range. It's a spot where, of course, he can be bluffing. Um, and I might just have... I might just have enough equity here, actually. Maybe I shouldn't fold any of my range just because... Yeah, um, it's 
kind of close. I am like really close to the bottom of my range, so maybe I should. I don't know how often he's bluffing here. I could just call on my 10x and my better stuff, and I'm definitely calling enough. That way he can't have thin value 10x, but at the same time, nah. Okay, we'll fold that and we'll just call like our stronger stuff, I guess. Although there could be an argument there for just like calling everything just because people are going to bluff that river. I don't need to be good much more than like 28% of the time I have a bluff catcher. It doesn't really have a 10 there, I don't think, when he checks the turn. So it's either KX or air. You know, I should maybe just look him up there. Three bet game of ego with Ace King for value, hoping to gen top pair and stack him, basically. Um, when he four bets, I'm just going to stick it in like he's already shown he's like a bit of a crazy aggro fish. In fact, I'm starting to think he's like some kind of like horrible reg now, just because like he is. He's like made it a really reggy size to four bet. It doesn't change my plan here. Like if he has a fish, he might have a stronger range, but you know, I have Ace King and he's been spazzy, so. Yeah, so he does. He's a fish that four bit bluffs like a reg. <laughs> it's just weird. Maybe he's just a reg that's really aggro and likes to rant about bad beats and make horrible stack offs. That could be the case too. Um, defending queen ten here against the cutoff. Even though like we're not thrilled about it, we're getting like such a good price. That I think we kind of have to. Um, on this board, I'm gonna just give up because I have like absolutely zero um potential. Basically, my hand just sucks. I'll delay to see bet though. If he checks again, I'll bet there and just rep like queen x and jacks and stuff like that. When he leads, we just fold. Um, I'll check for this flop against a strong range I wasn't thrilled about calling with, but kind of had to for pot hunts in table 2. And with the 7s, pretty easy mining call against the really tight under the gun opener. Yeah, he's opening like 7% under the gun. Not going to get squeezed that often. Got a fish behind me. Really snap call with 7s, like nothing else to do. Okay, so I want to take a note of this guy can... Four bit bluff. Man versus big blind. Nine fifty to nineteen. It's a spot where my whole stabbing range wants to be quite small. I don't want to like be betting like pot here because it's just horrible when I have bluffs. So it doesn't really make sense to like turn my hand face up for value and do it. Turn card kind of blows, I guess, because now he's going to fold some king x more often. Um, that said, it's an easy bet for me. Um, I don't want to make it too big because I'd like him to call with King X. I'll make it like 14-40. Snap folds though. Probably has like 9x or something there anyway when he folds so quickly. But yeah, like there's no point making it huge there because I'm not going to get called that often. I want to be consistent with my stabbing range. I'm going to bet like any two cards there when it checks through to me. So I need to keep my sizing like consistent with the rest of my range. That's way more important. Got two fish here, so I'm going to 2.5x the button. If one of them was like calling shit loads out of the blind, like 3x, but they're like reasonably in line fish, and I want to like get as much action as I can basically. So I'm just going to make it 2.5 here, because that's the size I make it with my bluffs anyway. Six is here again, easy set mine with like fish and not many squeezes behind with this aggro guy. Looks pretty good. So. So yeah, feeling pretty good about my game at the moment. Um, working on both the the technical side of it, as you saw with those two the two word docs that I've shown you in the last few videos. Getting a lot of big pocket pairs here without too much action. Um, this is a spot where when he checks, yeah, he can be slow playing, but it's not going to be like super often. I realize that I need to time down a bit with value hands because when I have to roll the dice in three bet half the time, it takes me some time. So I've started like balancing my timing tiles out here by not three betting big hands instantly because in theory. It'd be seriously easy for people to figure out when I was rolling the dice, because I only roll the dice in my bluff range, right? It's not like I'm rolling the dice to see if I 3-bet aces. Um, yeah, I'm just going to check. I mean, it's I'm kind of tempted to bet for protection there. I'm going to have the best hand a fair bet. But that said, there's three of them. Two of fish. There's one's a fish that's still attacked. One is a guy that can be like slow playing because he's all over the place. So it's kind of close. Ace-jack here. I am definitely not holding flop. I will. Da, da, da. I can check raise, I can check call. I usually just check call this because I have ace high, then I can use the weaker hands. Definitely a bet now. Um, no need to go bigger than like eight here. Eight's even a bet on the big side. Just for protection. I'm never going to get called by worse, but I might get called by a spade draw that I'm ahead of, and I protect my equity. If I let like a river card roll off, then I'm just basically 
I'm getting kind of destroyed. King of, King of Diamonds River here is kind of interesting because I don't want to fold when I have this part of my range because I have like equity to the nuts and I don't have so much here. It's like four bucks which makes me like not want to... makes me kind of want to like raise and just turn this hand into a bluff. I could like call again and then try to show down but... Um... Yeah, I mean, I expect him to bluff this turn a bunch as well. I'm just going to raise the turn here and possibly give up the river, but I think I'm giving myself a good price here. It needs to work less than half the time, and I have some equity of calls, so it can't be too bad. For what it's worth, I'd raise way bigger here if I actually had a value hand, but I don't think he really has reason to think that's the case, so I can be exploitable with my sizing, given that it's a rarer spot here. I don't feel good about calling again, just because like he could be like, making some weird stupid thin barrel with like 10x or something here. Um, on the 9 river like Queen Jack gets there which I block a bit. Um, I don't, it's not like a flush river, I don't really expect a king to fold. So I think I'm just going to give up and just use the fact that the turn bet was, the turn raise was probably a plus EV in and of itself against his range. This guy I don't know too much about but this is part of my 3 bit bluff range from this position. No dice needed, it's just a hundred percent part of it. And we just snap fold here with zero showdown value. Check calling the King Jack on the mono board. Um on other boards, I definitely consider check raising that hand for value. I think this one's just a little bit too wet though. Um I don't have too much of a turn leading range in these spots, but I kinda like it here. Like villain can check back a bunch and I think he checks back that kind of turn a lot. I don't like giving random spade hands like a free card. And I think that he checks back a lot of jack x and 10x now, maybe, that are going to call turn. Um, and if he has like ace of spades, I think he's calling the lead anyway, so I'm not losing any value from a hand like that by not check calling. So yeah, I think that's one of the spots where my range wants to lead, but I'm going to mark it and just make sure I've got a decent strategy there and it all makes sense, basically. I'm going to mark this hand as well, the ace jack one, just to make sure that wasn't spewy, but I think it's probably okay. Um, yeah. Like the sizing is really small, it could be that it's just not bluffy. Um, and in that case I should just fold the turn, but you know, I can get myself a really good price there with some equity to the nuts, so I think it's fine. Um, I'm going to 2.5 this button. The reason I don't want to like 3x it is just because this guy doesn't really like to fold, so I don't want to build like massive pots with a wide range when I'm not going to have much c bet fold equity. I'd rather just make it a bit smaller. Um, but I don't want to min raise either because I kind of want a bit more money than that in the pot when it's small blind calls as well and stuff like that. So I think 2.5x is about right in that situation. Um, how to play this hand here? I could just. I think I'll just c bet like 3 and not need too many folds and hopefully get enough folds here we get min 3 bet and cold called like we're getting like such an immense price now I'm gonna check back here and like consider heroing rivers maybe he's got guards but as, as, as he just calls king high and then banks a 7 we can't really fold anything to this because with 10-5 suited we can flop flushes and things like that. Our price is just so great that it's pretty unfeasible for us to fold anything. This guy checks here. I'm going to definitely stab here if this comes around to me. I feel like the reg checks so quickly it doesn't have a strong range and this guy seems kind of fit or fold like straightforward. So I've got back there flush draw and a back there straight draw. Yeah, sometimes he's slow playing here for sure because he's like a dumb fish but a lot of times he's just giving up and just playing like straightforward fit or fold kind of way. He's 10, we definitely don't defend yet. Yeah, turns out here that he's playing trappy. Or whatever, but yeah, that bet should definitely be good. Um, Ace 9, I'm just going to fold here because I've got like two reggae players in the blinds. If this guy was in the blinds instead and I had position on him, I'd open it for sure. But against two regs, I don't really think so. Again, like I want to 3 bet King 3 here because I'm flatting a bunch with this guy being in the big blind. So my whole hands get pushed down a bit basically. So I'm going to be 3-betting 
hands that I would. One reason not to is that I'm really active at this table, but I'm going to be three betting hands that I would be folding normally, and I'm going to be calling hands that I'd be three bet bluffing normally. Um, so yeah, because of the guy in the big blind, it's not a squeezer, it's a guy I want to play pots with. I definitely want to call more there. Um, I'm going to just cold call here with 10s, I'm getting a really good price. It's kind of like a fishy line because my range is like really face up and stuff, but I don't really see a better line. I don't like 4 betting there, especially when this, this miss point G is fairly straightforward. Um, not really stabbing here, I think again this player can be like trapping with this short stack and like just have a monstrous range here. Um, and I have showdown value anyway if it gets to it. This guy's going to find out though, he's just going to stab. And now we definitely get out of there. I think this check call is actually pretty strong most of the time from this kind of player type. <clears throat> so not the most eventful of sessions so far. A couple of like mediocrely interesting spots but nothing much. Alright, not much going on. I think I will wrap up for today's video. Hopefully we'll get a more interesting live play next time. Um, hope you enjoyed the analysis at the start and that you've now got a good idea how my whole system is working with respect to the way I'm sort of going over hands, revising hands, um, doing session reviews and that kind of thing. So, since I've not been dealt any big hands, I will leave it there for today after we see what happens with a5 maybe we get into like a monstrous pot who knows and next time i'm going to show you guys some of the other stuff i do on my computer with my sort of some of the other stuff i use methods i use to learn poker and improve my game um i also have like a mental game oh we have kings we may as well play this i have a mental game document as well where i like set myself mental game goals to sort of have a better mental game and a healthier approach to the game and that kind of thing so Stay tuned for that next time. I'll show you that. Maybe go over some more strategic hands from the from the strategy document. So I'll see you in the next video and leave me any any questions or comments. Thanks for watching.